Good morning. My name is Pike Brown, and as Bob said, I'm a senior economist at Landcare Research in New Zealand. I care deeply about invasive alien species. And I do so for a number of reasons. I do so, first of all, because of biodiversity. Because I have seen firsthand that invasive alien species affect native biodiversity in the places where I have lived. I care about invasive alien species because they impact uh, traditions and culture where I live. Maybe by impacting some of these species that I depend on or that, that are part of my uh, cultural tradition. I care about invasive alien species because they affect livelihoods. So for example, by outcompeting agriculture. They impact crops and the ability of farmers to earn a living. They impact tourism, as tourists often come to, to countries to see the native biodiversity. And I care about invasive alien species because it's my job to care about invasive alien species. But I'm a complex person, too. I care about invasive alien species, but I also care very much about education, and about health care, and about public safety, and lots of other things. So I have to set priorities for myself. I'm not always sure how to do that, because some of these things I can put dollar values on, and some of these things are just something that I feel in my gut. I'm able to say, well, this is a really important species, but I'm not quite sure why. So if I'm not quite sure always how to set priorities for myself, it's a really much bigger challenge in helping the government to set priorities. Because some of these things that I feel on the inside, I'm not quite sure how to put a value on it. So what I'm going to do today, what Adam and I are going to be talking about, is valuing the things that we're able to do and acknowledging the things that we're not able to do. So we're going to put values on those things that we're able to and not on those that we can't. But we're going to acknowledge those things that we can't. And sometimes, even though we're not going to be able to put a value on everything, we're still going to be able to tell a clear and compelling story. And that's what we're going to do today using a case study um, from the Fiji Islands. So, Land care research, as you know, is in the South Pacific. And what you may not know about land care, uh, about um, New Zealand, I'm sorry, New Zealand is in the South Pacific. And what you may not know about New Zealand is that um, we had only three spe species of land mammals. Only three species of land mam mammals. And they were all bats. And as a result of this, we had a very varied and prolific bird life that evolved in the absence of any mammals, any rodents, or any predators, really, until man arrived. And man didn't arrive until about 800 years ago. So in the last 800 years, there have been 40 extinctions of native birds. And now New Zealand has the highest degree of endemism and also the highest degree of threatened bird life. So the New Zealand government has been very serious about protecting its native species with the following recognition. London has Big Ben, and Paris has the Eiffel Tower, and New Zealand has native birds. That's what people come to New Zealand to see, and so we've got to protect those species. And so they began a massive campaign to uh, eradicate stoats and, and weasels and other mustelids, and rats and other uh, rodents in order to protect the native birds, and it's worked. It's worked quite, quite well. A lot of species uh, that were once quite threatened are now um, not, not so critically endangered, still being managed. So through this expertise um, in developing uh, uh, ways of managing invasive species in New Zealand, land care research and other actors have worked throughout the Pacific, including in Fiji. Um, and uh, we're going to give a presentation today about some work that Adam and I did in the Fiji Islands and then draw some parallels for the Caribbean. Okay, so we're going to put a dollar value on some things. We're not going to put a dollar value on other things. In order to be able to put dollar values on things, we need to collect primary data. And so what we're going to do in this project is we're going to talk to people about how they experience invasive alien species. We're going to understand how invasive alien species negatively impact their livelihoods, but also positively impact their livelihoods. 
So in Fiji, uh, there are quite a lot of, of uh, invasive alien species. Uh, it's a, a situation that's very similar to uh, the Caribbean, where you have a small island state, and it's lots of tourism, lots of travel between islands, and so uh, there's a spread of invasive species um, across, across uh, countries. We're going to focus on five alien invasive species, three of which are on IUCN's worst 100 list. The species that we focus on are, are one bird species, two plant species, uh, an invertebrate, and the mongoose. So we have bulbul, moremia vine, terra beetle, and African tulip tree, in addition to the mongoose. We have surveyed uh, 476 households in Fiji in order to undertake this work. Um, 360 of them were on BT11, which is the largest island in Fiji. And we did a very comprehensive survey. We had about 2,400 data points for each individual household. So we collected information about their demographics and education and health, time allocation, cropping, and even the cropping information, we had 538 data points just on that. So very detailed information. We asked questions about livestock and fishing, labor income, durable goods and housing. A series of questions focused on invasive species, targeted towards invasive species, including the perceived harmfulness of, or advantages of their presence. This took about two hours on average for each household, but it gave us a tremendously rich data set. In addition to the household survey, we conducted a community survey where we met in focus groups with community elders. And we asked them to uh, enumerate some of the uh, ideas and problems associated with the invasive alien species. For example, how long ago did it arrive? And in what ways is this species, is this species useful for the community or the village? What do people encourage, do to encourage its presence there in the village? And then in what ways is the species bad for the village? And what do people do to discourage it? So in this way, we understand how people are feeling about the invasive alien species, which of those they want to control the most, and also what people are presently doing to manage it. This is our study site. So uh, Fiji has about 300 islands. Uh, we're on the main island, the largest island, and we're on the eastern side of, of the island, just to keep the study manageable. Now, um, here's just a few key summary statistics that I want to share with you, just so that you understand a little bit about, uh, about uh, the context. So we're going to be dealing with most things at the village level. We didn't interview every household in the village, but we interviewed a sample of households in the village. And so in, on average, the uh, average village has about 44 households five people in each household, and about 10 years of education. So these are people with high levels of education. They also make pretty good income. This is about 70,000 TT in terms of their income. 71% of their income is derived from cropping. So this is going to be a quite important source of information. And you can imagine then that the invasive alien species that affect crops are going to be those that are most serious to them. They have about one, hectare, one and a half hectares per household. They spend 35 hours per week in cropping. And they also, interestingly, spend about six hours per week working on behalf of the village. And I'm going to tell you why that's important in just a moment. So in the community survey, we asked when the, when the invasive species first arrived, we also asked about whether its presence has been increasing over time or decreasing over time or has remained steady. And it's this light blue that says increasing. And you can see across all five of these species, the presence has really been increasing in recent years, suggesting that the problem is becoming worse and that it's going to get worse without management. We didn't only focus on these five species. We actually asked about, about 20 species, including um, the iguana, which is, uh, iguana iguana is making inroads there, uh, certain other tree species, uh, wild boar, things like that. Some of these things you also have in the Caribbean. Now, as I started today, I told you that I care about a lot of things. I care deeply about invasive species. I also care about things like healthcare. And this is going to be true of Fijian villagers as well. And so if you just go into a village and you ask 
how bad are invasive species? They're going to say, oh, it's terrible. And we need to control them. And we need to throw every resource we have at controlling invasive species. And we rarely ask them, well, what's the trade-off? And so I wanted to be explicit about that in this case. So in this village, in these villages that we went to, we gave people a pile of beans. And the beans was intended to represent the total amount of money that the uh, government had in all to spend on all of its budget considerations. So education and health care and defense and, and um, public housing, all kinds of things that people care about. So that people had to tell us how much they cared about invasive alien species, but also to be cognizant of what they're not spending money on by spending money on invasive alien species. So the question was, if you're the budget minister, how much would you allocate to each of these categories? This is what they said. Control of harmful species, invasive alien species, is right here with 6.7% of the budget. It's actually quite significant. That's a very large amount of money. In truth, the, the Fijian government spends less than one half of 1% controlling invasive alien species, including biosecurity. Okay? So this suggests that for the government, at least, that this is a real priority for people. And it's not a priority in an abstract where we just said, how much money would you throw at the problem, but how much money in a relative sense. Now, we, they would have a certain number of beans in the, in the pile, and it might be 10 beans out of the total that, that we gave them. And then we said, well, how would you allocate that to different invasive alien species? And overwhelmingly, they identified two of them. It's the taro beetle with 38% and the African tulip tree with 30, 33%. We're going to focus on the African tulip tree as we go through the rest of our example today. But you can see that this is a quite important uh, problem for people. Adam's going to go into more detail about why that is. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is that we, um, we just ask people about how much they think that it's a problem by asking them to, to set priorities for the government. We also ask them how much they're willing to pay for eradication. Now, this is a common type of question in survey research in developed countries because people uh, pay, pay taxes and virtually everybody pays taxes. And so you can actually phrase a question around how much in, in additional taxes are you willing to pay to eradicate a species? In Fiji and in many Caribbean countries, most people actually don't pay taxes. But um, in Fiji, there's actually a, a, a big tradition of volunteering on behalf of the community. I put up that information earlier. People spent six hours, on average, volunteering each week for their communities. And this is often things like cleaning the church or mowing the, the community lawns, things like that. So we ask people, how many additional hours per week are you willing to volunteer to control the worst invasive alien species, either the taro beetle or the tulip tree? And the average number was 11. So they're willing to triple their volunteering time to control these species, which tells us that for ordinary people that don't usually get a say in these things, Invasive alien species really matter quite a lot. So we're going to focus here just on three of them, the African tulip tree, the Moremia vine, and the mongoose. Um, on average, we ask, how much time per week do you spend controlling these species? In the African tulip tree, they spend almost four hours per week. So they spend 36 hours per week in farming activities, and four of them are spent pulling this invasive tree. By contrast, they don't spend very much time with Moremia or Mongoose at all. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Adam, who's going to talk about how we turn this then into a cost-benefit analysis. All right, thank you, Mike. Yeah, building on this, we also wanted to point out that the taro beetle was another another issue or whatever, but we found that, you know, despite it being a pest, no one actually spent any money on pesticides and managing it. Uh, at the same time, the bolo was a bird that kind of eats at, at, at fruits and vegetables and things like that, but again, um, pretty much no time or money. So it's, 
also allowed us to question is this a capacity thing or a, a, a lack of, of knowledge or caring or, or, or simply that, that it wasn't as much uh, of an issue as we perhaps thought. Okay, so now we're moving to the cost-benefit analysis that, that will be kind of the, the crux of, of, of what everyone's going to talk to uh, today. And uh, those that went through the training, this is all these numbers and, uh, and terminology are going to be uh, obviously right in the forefront of, of what we're talking about. Those who aren't aware of, of, of economics and, and some of the things we're doing, um, bear with us, but this is kind of the standard standard terminology. I'm not going to necessarily go and give a, an overview on how cost-benefit analysis is applied, but essentially these are the things that you really need to define when you're going through setting up for, for collecting the data and then going through on the analysis. So the first one is project period. That's specifying how long um, are you looking to focus on as, as kind of a resource manager to, to, to allocate time and resources to uh, to manage uh, the invasive. And, and what we've said in, in, in our projects here is we want to look at over 50 year time horizon. Obviously the biological nature of, of these invasives mean you have to think about the issue long term. Uh, potentially in island states, if it's not there or if it's relatively small, you can think about this in perhaps a much shorter terms in the sense that you can have kind of a rapid deployment, eradication, and then focus uh, uh, after that on, on kind of uh, protection and border security. The discount rate, what this does is allow us to essentially discount future costs and benefits back to present terms. So it's this idea that kind of the inverse of, of interest and things that you earn that basically we want to consume things today and we value things today much more than we value something in 50 years from now. So by using a discount rate, it's basically saying that in every year we value something 8% less relative than we value today. We'd rather consume something today than have to wait another year. Therefore, we're kind of discounting uh, that period that we want to. And it's, uh, it's, it's standard for basically economic studies of this sort to um, allow us to bring, uh, summarize um, long-term uh, flows of money back into kind of present day value. Um, costs, most of the costs that we incur are labor, materials, machinery, maintenance, and operating. So this is the cost of going through with the project, not the cost that the invasives are bringing onto society. What those are essentially are, are, are characterized as monetized benefits or avoided damages. So when you go through and, 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 and dedicate labor materials, machinery, etc., what that does is reduce the impact, therefore accruing benefits um, to particular categories. Um, there's also a series of non-monetized benefits that we also want to try to quantify, and that's things like the area and the species protected, uh, the bio maybe the biodiversity enhancement, and then also cultural values. Uh, so some of some of you know, as as Pike was saying, it's not just about the agriculture, but it might also be about some of the culture of do, it's not just the crops, but the culture behind cultivating the crops, uh, particular uh, species. Um, in, in the Pacific, uh, uh, villages and tribes have specific totems and things that, that they hold high value as well. Um, they're basically uh, uh, manifests of their ancestors and things like that. And then finally, management effectiveness. So this is if we're going to assess a series of different intervention options. We want to know what is the relative effectiveness in terms of uh, controlling, managing, reducing, and eradicating the species. And that allows us to assess the relative costs and benefits across the multiple um, options. Uh, so as Pike said, what I'm going to do is more in detail on the African tulip tree. Um, for context, I know that this is definitely um, uh, native, uh, not native, but present in, a, in many islands in, uh, in, in the Caribbean. Um, I know there's actually been a lot of studies on this out of Puerto Rico. Some of the biological um, information that we use has actually been uh, based on studies out of, out of Puerto Rico. Um, what this is showing is essentially, as Pike said, in community surveys, we needed to assess the kind of relative impact of, of uh, the, the species and also whether or not it was increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. But what we found first is that it's present in 29 out of the 30 villages that we surveyed, and of that, um, essentially, 27 of them said the species is still increasing. But for context, it was first arrived in Fiji in 1931. So it's been there already for about 80 years. Uh, and for the most part, despite them saying that they're doing management, control, uh, et cetera, um, it's, it's, it's mostly increasing. The other thing we wanted to do is this points out kind of the variation in, in geography um, in terms of we went to villages that were by major roads, off major roads, coastal, et cetera. So we also needed, wanted to assess uh, if there's any relative impact, um, maybe based on geography and stuff. But what we found is essentially it's still increasing, still spreading, uh, still a problem. Um, so the big impacts that we assessed is 76% uh, of the villages said that it, it, it mainly reduces uh, agricultural output. 
uh, and, and yields by about 8% on average. Uh, it competes with other trees, uh, reduces grazing land, uh, but they also said that there are some benefits of use. So this is the thing of acknowledging that if we want to go in with this big eradication or control program, we need to understand that what they actually like about it as well. Because unless you kind of get the buy-in and understand how to incentivize those who are managing the land, you're not going to have much success. So we found that 52% um, said it provides some building materials, 27% um, said it provides firewood for cooking, and 9% said um, the bright orange flowers um, are attractive and they attract bird and wild animals. Um, with that though, most of these is, is, is the tree itself is actually quite um, uh, quite dense and also um, very high in moisture content, so it actually is not that good for cooking and firewood, etc. They would be perfectly happy if you planted some other native species or, or had a, an alternative substitute. Um, you know, they're, they're not, even though they said that, that they do use it, they're not holding this dearly about. Um, and the way we also got around that is we asked a series of questions about um, essentially asking uh, the African tulip tree is good for me, I do things to promote the African tulip tree, etc. And what we can do from there is we could tease out kind of a more favorable versus uh, less favorable um, perception. And what we found is basically almost 80% of the household surveys, we found that they answered negatively about all the series of questions, which means they, they find it, it that it's highly negative. Um, they have a highly negative aspect or view of, of the tree. There, therefore, what it does is suggest that um, there's a lot of support to going in with some sort of control program uh, in the region. Okay, so whenever you do a cost-benefit analysis, you need to basically, you're looking at measuring a kind of a do or a management option relative to a do-nothing option. And, and what this does is allow you to then to choose kind of what the most robust uh, decision may be from an economic perspective. So in order to do that, what you really need to do is you need to trace out what the population and damage curves might be from the different interventions that you're looking at. Um, we found that on average, uh, about 20% of the land or the 20% of the carrying capacity uh, of the tree was, was kind of the norm in the villages that we, that we experienced. And so what we're saying is that kind of if you carried on from, uh, from today forward and you did absolutely nothing, the carrying capacity could maybe increase to basically reaching full capacity within about 25 years. Uh, with that, we did say that that you know they were doing some management four hours uh, per week, uh, uh, but most part it was still increasing, right? So we, we kind of went through and said, well, it is going to be in check relative to the do nothing case, but um, based on the surveys, it's still going to keep uh, increasing to at least maybe potentially up to 50% of carrying capacity. And then finally, there's the integrated management approach, which is much more you work with extension officers, you have specific uh, steps about uh, cutting, burning, um, basically tilling, reducing uh, the seed bank, etc. cetera. Um, and what that does is, is essentially that's gonna help us get it to at least under control. Um, the species is pretty much on almost every island in Fiji. Uh, an eradication program is basically not, not feasible. There's just too many seeds and uh, it's been too established to think about that we could completely eradicate this. But under kind of an intensive program where people are essentially using their time more effectively to control the tree, um, basically we, we're, on, we're under the impression that it could probably be reduced to about 10% of carrying capacity. So from here, what this does is allow us to, to measure out the relative benefits under these three population curves. Um, what we then need to do is we need to quantify what the value is of the things that we're monetizing in terms of benefits and cost. So the benefits we're going to get from uh, reducing from the do-nothing case to the current management to the integrated case are avoiding damages from crop, livestock, forestry. Uh, but with that, we're facing a lot of costs. And those costs are basically for different herbicides, uh, the labor. Um, the big trees are going to require a bulldozer or a digger to basically because the roots are, are, are quite deep. Um, and then, in addition to that, you're going to need some machetes, gloves, hand saws, drench guns, sprayers to basically um, kind of do the herb to, to apply the herbicides and get off um, all the different all the various stems. Uh, and so, this what what this does is then allow us to establish how much effort and how much cost we need to put in for each one of these categories. Um, the next thing that we've done is we've applied this. So, what we've done is. All you guys that were in the training be familiar with, with our, our famous cost-benefit analysis toolkit that we've developed. So what we've done is we've taken away that, that, that you can take all those numbers, those population growth curves, and you can essentially establish them by filling in just a series of 
boxes kind of in a kind of a user specific uh, Excel tool that allows us to tease out what those growth curves look like and what the kind of flow of costs and benefits might be over time. So by simply uh, putting in uh, the figures from the, from the prior slide, um, it allows us to populate uh, basically a series of figures, numbers, and do the calculation. So you'll, you'll kind of see these recurring slides um, today because pretty much everybody uh, that's presenting used uh, some aspect of the toolkit that we developed. Okay, so when we put all that stuff through, what we get is um, a summary of the costs and the benefits over the 50-year period of the project. So anything in the light blue bar up is a benefit that's been accrued in terms of avoided damages relative to the do-nothing case. Anything below is the additional costs that were faced from management on top of doing that. So this is the cost of time, herbicides, capital, et cetera. And so what we found is that in the current management approach, um, it's still occurring, this is on a per hectare basis, close to 19,000 Fijian dollars or 10,000 Fijian dollars per hectare over the lifetime of the project. Um, so it's saying that what people are going for, that it's not a waste of time and effort relative to the do-nothing case. They are accruing benefits relative to just letting the tree grow. Um, but on top of that, we found that for an additional cost, um, on top of the current management, but a lot more effectiveness, uh, you can basically more than double those uh, benefits. So you're getting up to 44 million, uh, 44,000 uh, per hectare in terms of uh, the, the benefits over the lifetime of the project. And so if you then multiply about 25,000 hectares in the study region, um, over the lifetime of the project, the integrated management approach is essentially getting us over 1 billion Fijian dollars of benefits relative to costs. Um, and even the current management approach is getting us about 456 million Fijian dollars, or about 250 million US dollars. So what it's saying is, going forward with the management seems to be, from a societal economic standpoint, is, is definitely the, the way to move forward. Um, it's a good use of resources. Uh, like we indicated, people said that, that it was an issue, they're willing to put forth efforts. So if we can just, um, basically in a more concentrated manner, uh, use more efficient management options, it's definitely a, uh, kind of a win-win situation. Um, quickly, just um, because of time, we can't necessarily go through the details of every single one of these studies, but uh, Pike and I have papers and reports and all this that lay out all the details, all the findings um, in a much more rigorous manner that uh, we can share with all. But then these are the four other species that we looked at. What it's showing here is in general, again, we asked about uh, presence and spread. All four of them are present in most of the villages as you can see by the red dots, most of them were spreading. The other key thing is that most villages were impacted in the sense of all five were there. So that's another thing. They've been well established. Uh, it's, it's, it's indicating that, it, that it's quite an issue. Um, in terms of favorability, the tarot beetle and the mongoose were, 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 were negatively favorable. Um, in almost all cases, the red vented bulbo kind of had a, a mixed distribution. And then the interesting one is the moremia vine. Um, that actually some found this to be kind of more favorable and, and, and with this is actually Landcare is actually doing some DNA testing right now to assess whether or not it's actually native to Fiji and other parts of the Pacific. So what this is, it had a lot of herbal remedies and cultural values and things like that associated with it. So what this says is that actually this has driven the research to think a bit more about, well maybe we don't actually want to go in and put a lot of effort to controlling Moremia because a lot of uh, communities found this to be positive and found that um, you know, it had some, some herbal remedies that, that, that they didn't find in any other plants or pharmaceuticals. Um, and then the cost-benefit uh, cost benefit analysis itself, these are all on a per hectare basis. What we found also is that, okay, these are the ones that were negatively, negatively um, basically indicating to be more negative in terms of from a, from a community or household perspective. And these are the ones that, that um, basically accrued higher net benefits. So from tarot beetle management, if you go in with a kind of a, a high chemical control to essentially almost eradicate the beetle, uh, over the lifetime of the project, you can get about $139,000 uh, per hectare. Um, but even if you do some kind of more organic cultural controls, you're still getting close to 100000 And uh, if you just completely switch to an alternative crop, uh, you're still going to get 81000 relative to kind of letting the beetle continue to grow and spread uh, through, the, through, the, through the island. Um, the interesting thing then, small mon the mongoose, any sort of trapping or hunting is going to accrue positive values, but again, at much smaller rates, these are only about $500 per hectare. Maybe that's also showing why people were putting in minimal management. So even without us doing this study, 
people inherently already did their cost benefit analysis and said it's not worth me taking my time to go around and hunt the mongoose it's not going to actually accrue that much benefits to uh to our village um the the bulb actually because the management you need to do here is you need to put nets and things like that over all your crops the cost of doing that it was not worth the actual benefits of it uh and then finally in Moremia, we actually found there's kind of a mix of of of, of costs and benefits um, depending on on the management approach so to summarize we targeted five key invasive species in fiji uh and the village level study looked it up to 15. Um, the tulip tree and the tarot beetle were found to be the worst invasives um, from both perception and then also from economic impact standpoint. And basically what we found, we have found high positive, high and positive net present values relative to do nothing and status quo, suggesting that we need to go forth on more um, basic complex management and put in a greater effort that's going to accrue uh, better, more benefits to society. Uh, households are willing to put in additional effort. Uh, if proven methods to control the invasive exist. So this is that's what Pike pointed to on the willingness to volunteer. The question was if we can definitely prove to get this problem under control in the village, people are willing to do up to 11 more hours of um, basically work and effort per year for that. But they need to basically, they, they want proof that what, what they're doing is actually gonna somehow benefit them. Um, and then finally, uh, the mongoose, the red vented bulbul, and the moremia vine uh, had much lower impacts on village livelihoods um, and then that was shown with lower net present value, but also the negative perception was not nearly as strong. And so what this is also pointing to that at least um, on the monetized uh, value standpoint is that if you have a limited resource budget, maybe these are not necessarily the species you want to go in and focus first. First focus on some of those that are much, uh, much greater problem, have higher negative uh, perception and can accrue you know, up to 50,000 to 100,000 uh, dollars per hectare and benefits over the lifetime of the project. So, and then, um, basically the idea is we took our case studies and we took our toolkit and we kind of took our kind of understanding of how management uh, works in the Caribbean, I mean in the Pacific, and through the training uh, here, we've managed to learn a lot about kind of how things are working in the Caribbean. Also, uh, the participants have been able to apply a lot of the same methods here. It's kind of um, a way to, um, because of the similar kind of economic, geographical, social uh, uh, kind of similarities. And uh, with that, I think um, essentially what we're going to do now is we're going to flow into um, about eight presentations uh, that are going to kind of flow similar to, to, to what I've discussed here, where people, like I said, they use the toolkit and they use kind of the same methods that we've discussed here uh, to kind of conduct their own cost benefit analysis and accrue. Um, some findings on maybe what might be the most uh, efficient management option to do, um, allow them to think a bit more about what data they need, what assumptions they need to make when going forward, uh, and thinking about, again, what interventions can you do to control these invasives under some sort of limited limited budget? Because as Pike indicated, we'd all like to control everything, but we live in a world of scarce resources, and at least um, these types of methods allow us to assess kind of the most efficient use of some of those resources. So. With that, I thank you, and um, I think I invite the Bahamas up to uh, give their talk.